Welcome to the Grand Theft World podcast, hosted and sponsored by the fine members over at GrandTheftWorld.com. This is episode 130, and it is titled Turnkey Totalitarianism, a, a phrase, a turn of phrase used by RFK in last week's show. We thought it was so good. We're going to dig into all these applications of robotics and AI in our lives tonight. Okay, so hot off the press, we got this Epstein calendar that just broke. And there's some interesting people he's been meeting with. Uh, one of the most notable, uh, aside from a CIA director, a Rothschild, and uh, Dershowitz, who's a usual suspect, is this guy Noam Chomsky. And we're going to get into Chomsky's, Chomsky's reaction to being questioned about this, which I thought was very interesting. The Wall Street Journal has published a bombshell new report on Jeffrey Epstein's private calendar, including previously unseen schedules, emails, and contacts detailing the wide circle of elites who associated with Jeffrey Epstein years after he was convicted of sex crimes in 2008. CIA Director William Burns had three meetings scheduled with Epstein in 2014 when he was Deputy Secretary of State. A CIA spokesperson told the journal that the two men had, quote, no relationship. White House counsel for the Obama administration, Catherine Rumler, had dozens of meetings with Epstein in the years after her White House service and before she became a top lawyer at Goldman Sachs Group Incorporated. She said she regrets ever knowing Epstein. Leon Botstein, the president of Bard College, invited Epstein, who brought a group of young female guests to the campus. He told the journal he was trying to elicit a donation from the disgraced financier. And then there's Noam Chomsky, the famed leftist political activist and professor who was scheduled to fly with Epstein and to have dinner at Epstein's Manhattan townhouse in 2015. He maintains his relationship with Epstein is, quote, no one's business and that they discussed academia. Director Eric Weinstein weighed in on the revelations on Twitter. The central question remains, was Jeffrey Epstein a construct of the intelligence community? Who, as state-sponsored predator, cannot be investigated by news media, cooperating with government, for reasons of national security? Earlier, rewinding, going back to the beginning of the week, as we all know, Tucker Carlson got fired. Or did he? Megyn Kelly says he's not fired. So Tucker Carlson is now free of Fox News of having to deliver content for them, but he's not quite free of the contract to produce on his own yet. We're going to find out more about that tonight. Good evening, it's Tucker Carlson. One of the first things you realize when you step outside the noise for a few days is how many genuinely nice people there are in this country, kind and decent people, people who really care about what's true, and a bunch of hilarious people also, a lot of those. It's gotta be the majority of the population, even now. So that's heartening. The other thing you notice when you take a little time off is how unbelievably stupid most of the debates you see on television are. They're completely irrelevant. They mean nothing. In five years, we won't even remember that we had them. Trust me, as someone who's participated. And yet at the same time, and this is the amazing thing, the undeniably big topics, the ones that will define our future, get virtually no discussion at all. War, civil liberties, emerging science, demographic change, corporate power, natural resources. When was the last time you heard a legitimate debate about any of those issues? It's been a long time. Debates like that are not permitted in American media. Both political parties and their donors have reached consensus on what benefits them, and they actively collude to shut down any conversation about it. Suddenly, the United States looks very much like a one-party state. That's a depressing realization, but it's not permanent. Our current orthodoxies won't last. They're brain dead. Nobody actually believes them. Hardly anyone's life is improved by them. This moment is too inherently ridiculous to continue, and so it won't. The people in charge know this. That's why they're hysterical and aggressive. They're afraid. They've given up persuasion. They're resorting to force. But it won't work. When honest people say what's true, calmly and without embarrassment, they become powerful. At the same time, the liars who've been trying to silence them shrink, and they become weaker. That's the iron law of the universe. True. Um, and that's enough. As long as you can hear the words, there is hope. See you soon. Uh, the Biden campaign conspired. Conspired. 
to suppress the Hunter Biden laptop. It's not surprising, but even more evidence has been coming out this past week. We'd like to get that on the record. We got this story from Spiked. And uh, I always love to uh, give you guys the NewsGuard certification, 100 out of 100. <laughs> that's right. It is NewsGuard certified. And people are like, that's the government. So the government certified it. Would call it whatever you want. Joe Biden's sinister disinformation campaign. They say last week it was revealed that shortly before the 2020 election, Joe Biden's presidential campaign conspired with 51 former spies to discredit the New York Post discoveries from the Hunter Biden laptop. That is to say, a person running for office conspired with government officials to discredit a news story that could harm their campaign. And by the way, when Michael Morrell was asked under oath uh, why he did it, he said it was because he wanted Joe Biden to be elected. He just straight up said that. Because you can get away with it, right? It's a two-tier system. Yeah. They let you when you're famous. With the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Oof. So, uh, well, there you go. Does this mean that the country doesn't exist or something? It means it's not our country anymore. Yeah, yeah it's like being worn as a skin suit by a cult. Creepy, yep. corrupt individuals mm -hmm. just doing whatever they want. <clears throat> We're sitting here watching. How are you doing? And then we've got this story where Ron DeSantis went to Israel to pass a, a hate speech law for Florida. So we're going to understand uh, more about that story. What's going on with hate speech down in Florida? A standing ovation. Thank you. Florida's governor is and has been big with Israeli government and business leaders. A friendly forum to test drive potential presidential foreign policy. We must support Israel's right to defend itself. And that includes strong military and intelligence cooperation. Governor Ron DeSantis delivered the keynote at Jerusalem's Museum of Tolerance and seized that moment to sign a Florida bill criminalizing the kind of anti-Semitic acts okay. on the rise. We're fighting back. And uh, pointing toward the AI and robotics revolution. We're going to look at the 20 years of Boston Dynamics robots and what they're really building out there. Boston Dynamics was founded in 1992. The company started off by creating realistic 3D computer simulations for aircraft launch operations for the Navy. But not long after, they started making physical robots. The first robot Boston Dynamics created was the Big Dog in 2005. The robot was designed to be able to carry heavy gear for soldiers in terrains too rough for vehicles. Instead of wheels, it had four legs, allowing it to move across surfaces that would defeat wheels. Big Dog was three feet long and stood 2.5 feet tall, making it about the size of a small mule. Despite appearing absurdly awkward in early videos posted by Boston Dynamics' YouTube channel, the robot was surprisingly proficient at keeping its legs under itself. Even when it was kicked by its tester, the Big Dog did not fall. Let's just hope the robot will not take revenge on humans for this kick. Big Dog was able to carry 340 pounds and climb at a 35 degree incline. It was constantly tested by the military to make sure it could be used in combat. And in 2012, the latest generation known as the Legged Squad Support System or LS3 was developed. It was a significant upgrade compared to Big Dog and could operate in hot, cold, wet, and dirty environments. It could also run faster at seven miles per hour and was roughly 10 times quieter. Despite improving Big Dog and investing millions at the end of 2015, the Big Dog project was discontinued. The reason was that the robot was too noisy for use in combat, which I can easily understand for the first iteration since it sounded like a swarm of bees. But even the latest generation LS3 wasn't quiet enough for military use. Fun fact, in 2013, Big Dog received an arm. It showed the world how robots could take over the world by throwing bricks at humans. In 2009, Boston Dynamics started working on a human-like robot named Petman. The robot could walk at 3.2 miles per hour.
Pet Man has hydraulic actuators, which act as muscles. In total, Pet Man has 30 hydraulic actuators. Next came one of the most exciting robots ever created by Boston Dynamics named Atlas. It is a humanoid robot based on the Pet Man robot the company had created in 2009. Atlas is the culmination of over a decade of hydraulic humanoid robotics work at Boston Dynamics. Originated in 2013, Atlas stood six feet, two inches tall and weighed 330 pounds. The company initially made the robot for the DARPA Robotics Challenge, a competition meant to accelerate robotics technology development to aid response efforts to natural and human-made disasters. The robot has undergone significant changes since its debut. In 2016, Atlas received a new design with a height of about five feet tall. The new version of Atlas is designed to operate both outdoors and inside buildings. It uses sensors in its body and legs to balance and LiDAR and stereo sensors in its head to avoid obstacles. Sadly, Atlas was heavily bullied and cyberbullying was taken to a whole other level. In 2017, Atlas was improved even further so that it could jump but far more impressively, it could do a backflip. With the next generation in 2018, Atlas could run outdoors. Now he could finally escape from the physical abuse in the lab. I hope he's fine. During the development process, new techniques were developed, allowing Atlas to use its whole body with complex algorithms to calculate the speed and coordination of its movement. It learned to do parkour and could do tricks with a success rate of about 80%. You thought that was impressive, in 2021, the humanoid robot could finish a whole parkour. Man, it's crazy how fast Atlas gets developed. You might ask yourself, why did they teach the robot to do parkour? At a practical level, um, it's a platform for us to do R&D on. And as an Atlas team, we're encouraged to push you know, that platform to its limits, like do the most crazy, exciting, high power stuff we can do with it. And so we're always expanding and pushing the limits of Atlas's capabilities. And then, you know, hopefully by extension, extending the capabilities of the company as well at the same time. So pushing the limits on Atlas pushed the innovation for both hardware and software that translates to all other robots at Boston Dynamics. But letting Atlas do parkour wasn't easy at all. Atlas was capable of doing tricks before, but what made this really challenging was that it had to do the entire course in one run. So Atlas had to be able to do tricks reliably. Fun fact, Boston Dynamics says it will not partner with those who wish to use robots as weapons. The original Spot, which has since become Spot Classic, became a turning point in Boston Dynamics robot evolution. It was designed for both indoor and outdoor operations, weighing in at around 160 pounds. It was faster, smaller, and more agile than the big dog models that came before it. The size reduction came from using an electronic instead of gas engine to power its hydraulic system. The company describes Spot Classic as the machine that, quote, laid the groundwork for the strong dynamic robot controls seen on Spot today. Multiple iterations were made, including Spot Mini in 2016, which is a smaller version weighing 55 pounds. The name was later changed to just Spot as it became the flagship design for the Spot model. The robot is all electric and runs for about 90 minutes on a charge. One year later, Spot received a new, more iconic yellow design. It is one of the quietest robots the company had ever built. Some versions also include an arm, allowing it to do more tasks, like opening doors. This is the most watched video from the Boston Dynamics YouTube channel and has over 140 million views. And just like you would expect from Boston Dynamics, Spot was also heavily abused. Spot was also able to do more tasks autonomously, including navigating through the lab facility. It uses data from the cameras to localize itself in the map and to detect and avoid obstacles. Spot was the first robot the company released commercially. In June 2020, it became available for consumers for $74,500.
know. That's a great question. You know, that's a great question. <laughs> we use ChatGPT to query information and the user can ask natural questions. And I was just wondering if I could dictate to it to say something specifically. What is your battery level? Battery level is currently at 53%. What is the voice coming from? It's a Google text-to-speech. We give the JSON to ChatGPT and explain what the structure is and how to read that JSON. Now ChatGPT can answer questions about that JSON. But how many inspections in your next mission? My next mission involves 20 inspections. Let's You're gonna say describe your next mission, mm -hmm. right? In the context, it's gonna to have to be like next mission location. Correct. Or something like or that. Or last mission. That should be pretty simple to do. The last mission was Route 66. It lasted 30 minutes and there were two thermal anomalies detected. There's two messages. One is a system message and one is phone right. whisper. I did next mission as a dictionary. That'll probably be better. Those are spot stickers. Funny thing is you ask Spot what's his name and the answer is I'm open AI. That is just messed up. Spot, are you standing up? Yes or no? I love the expressions. That's what I was looking for, the yes or no thing. The emotions are great. <laughs> the wiggling. <laughs> yeah. So these robot commands are based on its internal localization. So it's always gonna be a very precise 90 degree or one meter walk. Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. Can you please provide a question or a context for me to answer? You're crowding my space. Spot, walk backward. There you go. That's how you do it. And then we're also going to look at um, <clears throat> the AI being pointed back at the people who create it. So we did a little experiment in the past couple of days, and we took some of uh, Ministry of Defense's documents. We did a little AI stuff, and we're going to present to you our findings and summary from that little project. <laughs> Earlier this week, <clears throat> we were playing around with some of these new AI tools to see what they're all about. And a uh, good friend of the show, Joshua Hale, he he decided to take one of these applications and it gives you summaries of PDFs. And we thought, oh, that's great. That's very useful. And then there's the 11 labs where you can take people's voices and have them read things. So we thought, what better way to bring you this summary? I think it was generated in 2007, but it's a plan out till the year 2040. So it's the United Kingdom. British, uh, 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 British, uh, sorry, just the Great Britain's UK, U United Kingdom, uh, Ministry of Defense, the DCDC Strategic Trends Program, of which they have many issues. But I was just curious from the 2007 projection out to 2040, we're in the middle of that right now. Wouldn't it be great to have AI just find all that information in the document and tell us about the world we live in right now? What do we need to know in the mid 2020s? or in the early 2020s, right? So uh, we have this special report coming to you and we thought, you know, what, what better way to bring you this British documentary type of information, but then, uh, you know, we wanted to find a familiar voice that'll make you feel real comfortable with the plan for your future that you didn't have anything to do with, but it's, uh, you're not elected rulers or responsible for what follows. Go ahead and play that LD and uh, let's sit back and feel relaxed like we're watching the BBC. Global Strategic Trends is a report that provides a comprehensive view of the future based on trends and drivers. As residents of the United States in 2023, it is important to be aware of the following trends. The U.S. will remain a center of innovation, economic opportunity, and populist culture, which will be attractive to both states and individuals seeking support and partnership. The U.S. population is expected to grow robustly, and have less significant demographic aging compared to continental Europe, Russia, and Japan, which will help underpin U.S. economic performance and maintain U.S. influence and leadership in the context of contemporary powers. The locus of global power will move away from the U.S. and Europe towards Asia, resulting in a period of instability in international relations and the possibility of intense competition between major powers. The U.S. is likely to lose her hegemonic status as rising powers enjoy more rapid economic growth and close the technology gap in military capability. However, the U.S. economy and military will remain amongst the world's strongest and may be particularly adept in exploiting emergent technologies that could drive an economic resurgence. The incidence of armed conflict is likely to increase out to 2040, 
and the struggle to establish an effective system of global governance capable of responding to global challenges will be a central theme of the era. Grievance, nationalism, far-right ideologies, and influential religiously and philosophically inspired ideologies may result in a revival of communism, especially if it evolves and dissociates itself from the failures of the Soviet Union. The US-led liberal model, known as the Washington Consensus, constructed around the institutions and policies of the Western powers, has been the dominant global model, especially since the end of the Cold War. However, this model is likely to be unattractive to governments struggling with the adverse impact of poverty, climate change and global inequality, especially where ruling elites fear loss of political power. These states, especially in developing economies, are likely to adopt alternative models. Increased competition and confrontation may range from opposing U.S. diplomatic and trade initiatives to asymmetric attacks from ideologically opposed state and non-state actors. It sounds so much better coming from uh, a voice like that, doesn't it? Much more soothing. I'm just showing that yeah. there's the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defense planning out America's future out to 2040. Just in case anyone's paying attention to the themes laid out in this podcast, I thought it might be more palatable. And somebody who has a sir, I don't know if he has a sir before his name. I'm not even going to say his name because we don't want to get, we don't want to get with them right now. And last but not least, uh, we have one story that tops them all because we find out now that there is medical research that uh, a little known uh, ointment, treatment, tincture, however you want to see it, called CBD could have prevented millions of COVID deaths, but they don't want you to have treatments, therapeutics, preventatives, things that make the bad virus go away. Now, I'm going to give evidence today that the CBD, the cannabidiol, seems to have, and there's pretty good evidence from this study and other studies, antiviral properties. Now, we'll be looking at evidence that it uh, reduces the infection from SARS coronavirus 2 and helps with the illness. And we'll be looking at evidence that it helps with another RNA virus, hepatitis C. Now, let me tell you what evidence I'm going to be considering and you can decide if you want to watch this video. This is oral, by the way. It's not injections. And in all cases, it's been completely uh, non-toxic at the doses that have been described. Now, the first line of evidence that this works against SARS coronavirus 2 and probably other viruses, but the research is on SARS coronavirus 2, is in human lung cell cultures where it prevented infection. Uh, when the cells were infected, if they'd been exposed to the, to the uh, cannabidiol two hours before, it pre essentially prevented all of the infection. But it didn't work with THC. So this means that if people are smoking cannabis or using cannabis products that are mixed with CBD and THC, the ones that will get you high, it won't work. This is strictly the non-psychotropic version. Tetrahydrocannabinol inhibited the effect of the cannabidiol in terms of antiviral properties. So that's the first one, um, human cell cultures. The second evidence is from mice, so it actually works in animals. Infected mice, they were given CBD, cannabidiol, twice a day for four days, and they had 40 times less viral particles in their lungs. Really quite impressive. And the third line of evidence is human. Now, in the United States, they managed to recruit 1,221 people that are on cannabidiol to prevent epilepsy. And they found that they were 50% less likely to get infected with SARS coronavirus 2. And they had no follow up on whether they got sicker or not, but it would be likely that these people didn't get uh, sick as their counterparts may have done, especially with the early versions of SARS coronavirus 2. So three impressive lines of evidence we're going to look at. Probably works against hepatitis C, some evidence for that, terrible disease hepatitis C. Could well work against colds, flu, Ebola, mumps and measles. The reason I'm saying that is purely because they're other RNA viruses we don't know, but it could potentially work against that. So I would certainly call for uh, um, immediate research to be done on this. But of course, hemp plants, which is where this essentially comes from, can be grown up by the hectare and uh, hemp oil, the, the cannabidiol, can be produced for essentially nothing. And it can be produced by anyone. It's not a, it's not a specific preparation. Uh, 
So again, because any producer who, who meets basic food manufacturing requirements could set up and produce this, it's unlikely that Big Pharma are going to do the clinical trials. So this could be another one of those uh, potentially brilliant treatments that's going to be completely lost to humanity because there's no money in it. And I'm going to stop there, otherwise I'll get crossed. So we're going to dig into that story as well. And we also have a special guest tonight, the author of the Deep State Encyclopedia. Really graceful. So I started becoming interested in these topics when I left my corporate job. Uh, I worked in a cubicle in marketing for a long time, well, a couple of years out of grad school. And I did all kinds of video for professional sports, like commercial video for professional sports and stuff like that. So it freed up a lot of time eventually. And um, I only had a couple clients when I left and I started what things were going down. This was back in 2014. And we had all of the Black Lives Matter riots sort of emerging at that time. And I, that's when I started really noticing these buses of people with these professional signage and t-shirts and everything um, conveniently located next to these pallets of bricks, pallets of water, everything like that. And um, I said, wow, that seems orchestrated. And, it, and the news crew doesn't seem too totally concerned with it either. So um, it's almost like it, a script rolling out. So that's how I found that my foray into all of this was really through Black Lives Matter and George Soros. So I had a YouTube channel before um, I started doing conspiracy content, hidden history, conspiracy, stuff like that. But I was doing a fashion internship in college where I would use my YouTube channel to sort of interview people on campus and say you know what are you wearing today <laughs> and what's your outfit of the day and stuff like that kind of cringe um looking back on it but that material is still on there too because it was all part of the journey right um but so i already had a youtube channel established at that time and it'd been a few years since i had posted on there uh because i went back to you know, working a normal job and not being in school and things like that. So my first video back was, who is George Soros? And that took about six months for it to be removed from YouTube. But in that time, um, <laughs> it was just, I opened up a can of worms. Like once you start looking, you can't look away from this. You, you absolutely cannot. So I started compiling notes around that time um just links and things of that nature that uh were of interest to me and i would take down notes take down links catalog of all, all of this and years later when i'm trying to reference those links i'm noticing these things aren't there anymore even like what people consider a uh, valid media you know legacy media they've taken down articles especially on george soros by the way um and so i began to wonder oh, you know, maybe we do need to document some of this material off of the internet. We need to actually have it in print, um, something you can have in hand. So through my videos, through all of that, all the notes that I took, this was the Deep State Encyclopedia was basically a compilation of all those notes, all those things. And certainly some topics are a little longer than others, but um, yeah, George Soros was my entry to all of this. We have a big show tonight, lots of juicy information, lots of artifacts and evidence as well. Let's kick it off with Luke Radowski of wearechange.org and thebestpoliticalshirts.com. I need your opinion on this. How secure do you think a gated community is? We have these keypads where you need a code to get in. Only residents know the code, and I feel like it's pretty secure. I do wonder if these gate locks are hackable. Let me show you the process again. I'll just walk through over here and here's the gated door again. Just got to punch in the digits and I'm in. So really, what do you guys think? Is it secure? <laughs> I bet those HOA fees are absolutely enormous. And if there ever was a more perfect representation of how prohibition and the war on drugs work, that's it right there. They don't. They don't. 
What makes the Grand Theft World podcast unique, invigorating, exciting, and informative? Most other podcasts out there are either doing straight up interviews or they're just covering the daily news. They're covering current events from the day they happen. And that is effective. It's useful. It's a great starting point. And then sometimes these current events change during the week past the first story. So we like to give it a little time. You have to wait till some of the dust settles on these stories in order to give them accurate coverage. And the other thing that's really missing in the media landscape is covering the articles that are coming out every day. That's great. That's necessary. But who's bringing in contextual history so that you can understand what has been going on for decades and decades to lead up to the machinations and actions that we see unfolding today. So what we do here on the podcast is we cover current events. Many of these things are censored, but we wait about a week. As a forensic historian, I focused mainly through my career on the history of globalism and collectivism and things that they call maybe the new world order. There's a lot of facts to these sort of circumstances, groups, events, activities, working groups that they've had over time. So for Grand Theft World listeners, we not only break down the current events, most of which that are censored during the week, we provide you with contextual history. We give you the source notes, the references. We do deep dives, and this really empowers you with an understanding of context and history so that you can make more informed decisions in your life. There's also a community, a membership where you guys can actually ask questions and we can get into the show and share evidence. And there's a town hall weekly for Grand Theft World for those who listen to it and are interested in covering the stories that we don't get to during a six hour show. Listening to it an hour a day, you could uh, easily consume the week's news, but you're gonna have substance and meaning and context and understanding. And with that, you can make higher quality decisions in your life. So if you're interested in more quality in your life, go to grandtheftworld.com, click podcast at the top, and we'll see you there. Thank you. These allegations are false. This isn't Grand Theft Auto, folks. This isn't a video game. What are the most surprising things that you discovered once you started pulling on that thread, who he was connected to, what institutions he was influential over, what events he participated in? Come on, man. What are you talking about? Come on, man. No. You don't have to think about it, dude. I got this quote because uh, you said you didn't know much about Klaus Schwab. I made it my job. To, as soon as this happened, I'm like, okay, this guy's their front man. Let me learn about the official history of the World Economic Forum. I got their 40 year history. I got every book that Klaus Schwab has written or ghost written. I went through those books. This is one of the most interesting passages. Come on, man. Come on.